Cool. We're going live. You ready? All right. We are there. What's up, guys? What's up, man? What's up, Ashwin? Um, yeah, so for uh, anybody that is uh, out there as you guys join uh, the stream, give us a thumbs up or a comment or something along those lines to let us know, you know, whether whether or not you can hear us. Hopefully the sound is working. But yeah, this is uh, David, or better known as Shelvage, maybe. Uh, and I'm here with uh, Ashwin, Waltedware. Uh, we are picking up on a, uh, you know, the last, I guess, podcast episode that we did. How many weeks ago? I guess it doesn't matter, but uh, maybe like a month? Was it longer than that? A month or so. A month or two, something like that. It's been a, been a minute. Yeah, so uh, we are going to chat for a little bit, see see if uh, if any folks are out there watching or are listening, and uh, we'll go from there. We wanted to yeah. uh, kind of cover a few things, but I know that there were some questions that were put in the uh, community page of a post that I had shared about us going live. So maybe let's take a look at those questions real quick, and then we can... Uh, kind of opine on each of those, uh, or each of us opine on the three questions, and then we can maybe jump into one of the topics and see how see how we're doing on time. Let's, uh, let's go with that. Does that sound good, Ashman? That sounds great. Awesome. So uh, let's see here. Let me just grab, a... you know what? Uh... Let's start with the questions, and I'll uh, I may tap you in while I try to control sort part of the, the stream here. Yeah, so uh, hopefully everyone so can hear us. I but the, um, the first question about Horween make the best uh, shell portavin in the world is that what it is? Yeah, does Horween make the best shell in the world, or does someone else? And that is from Benjamin uh, Kenobi. Oh, Ben. Hi, Ben, ben Kenobi. Ben Kenobi. Uh, this is Yoda. Known as Kylo Ren. Uh, for those of you who are uninitiated into the Star Wars lingo, Ben being the the son of of uh, Han and Leia, uh, according to the current movies. But the question is a good one. It's uh, is Horween making the best shell cordovan these days? And I would say that Horween, in my opinion, does make the best shell cordovan out there. But Best is a very relative term. I think that Horween shell tends to behave the best as it's aging over time. I have had shell cordovan from Shinki, uh, Hikaku, uh, Mariam, and Chloe in Italy. So I've had a few different makeups. I have not had Rocado shell. I haven't had a few of the other uh, tanneries who specialize in shell. But I will say that Horween, you're getting a very consistent product. You're getting reproducibility um, as far as color of shell is going. You're getting a consistent thickness where the shells are going to roll and not have any creases. Uh, you're going to get generally uh, high quality control because Horween is typically putting out really high quality shells um, to makers. And you have a tried and true product that dates back 100-ish years. It's the, I think I, on its fifth or sixth generation now with Nick Horween kind of running running the show with uh, his dad who uh, kind of handing off the reins to him. So uh, yeah, Shell uh, in terms of consistency, quality, and just uh, getting a known product, it's great um, to, to start with a pair of Horween. Now I would say that there's nothing wrong with the other makers. Uh, in my experience, Chloe, which is, I think goes by the name uh, Genuine Shell Cordovan on Instagram. They have a very thick shell that takes a lot more to break in. Um, Mariam Tannery, uh, I'm a huge fan of their horse butt leather. So essentially that's a piece of leather that includes parts of the shell, but they themselves, I have not tried their shell. And then Shinki Hikaku, very nice uh, color consistency, a little less depth to the color of the shells that I've seen from Shinki Hikaku. And they tend to, at least in the pairs that I've had, um, have a thinner shell, which tends to roll, but also form these kind of tiny little micro creases. And so... Uh, from my standpoint, if I were to try to source a new pair of shoes and had my choice of Shell Cordovan manufacturer from which to source the upper leather, um, I would use Horween. So that's that's the answer to question one. Uh, question two. 
what is what it? Is, it? Uh, uh, is rare shell quarterman a real thing or is it marketing? Honestly, like this is a topic that's come up a bunch. I know that um, there's a the Full Grain podcast that's run by uh, Phil from Ashland Leather and uh, Nick Horween uh, talks a little bit about this in some of their episodes. So if you don't know them, you should go check out their podcast. It's pretty good. A um, lot of talking about Shell and other random things. And then there's the Stitch Down guys who've talked about it. The, what I hear is that uh, it's easiest to make darker color shell, uh, which um, typically is color eight and um, and what else? And, and the black shell cordovan. But, you know, there are other colors of shell that we don't see in production all that often, like the dark cognac colors, cigar, which is considered rare shell, which are also darker uh, leathers or da darker cordovan colors. So there's an argument that if you have a lighter color, you have to have a cleaner shell so that you don't see the imperfections popping through the tannage. Uh, and I actually think probably a lot of that is mythology, honestly. And I think that, you know, for a company like Alden, who largely orders color eight and black shell cordovan, it's probably a price thing, honestly. They have to get shell in large quantities. They know that color eight and black shell cordovan are tried and true models for them. And then they have this exclusivity where they have special runs of Ravello or whiskey or cognac or whatever else color they choose color for, uh, which are the rare colors for Alden. But yeah, I think that from the experience I've had with other makers of shell, like uh, Shinki Hikaku and others, that you can really make shell of high quality in any color. And so I think there's a bit of mythology being played in there that probably is backed by the financials of how companies that are kind of considered as having rare shell colors have to do their business. I think I agree with all of that. There's the, uh, do they make the best shell in the world? And uh, wait, is this the same question? Yeah, same question twice, yep. two different folks. Yeah, it's sort of makes sense. question twice. And then, yeah, and the, then the market, rare, rare shell. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would, I would, uh, definitely agree. I think the, the caveat there, uh, well, I don't know if it's a, if it's a caveat or not, but, um, with, uh, like rare shell, it's, it's, uh, factual in the sense that like light colored shell is harder to make than dark colored shell because, uh, you need a more pristine, like raw material to start with. Otherwise, like the blemishes are going to show through. So like the darker colors yeah are easier to find the raw materials for, but then from the standpoint of just like, how prevalent is it? Uh, it's pretty much just driven based off of orders. I think it's like usually ordered at least a year in advance. So it's just that like Horween's making what is ordered. If, yeah, if they I think that's got, really what it comes down to. Right, if they got and more orders. Like Alden is gonna order a lot more Shell Cordovan than say a company like an individual maker in Indonesia. So, there's going to be market economies and how the leather is tanned and, and dyed and all that, that they can only do in certain quantities for the type of company that they are. So I honestly think it's not really rare or hard to make something. It's, it's not like some sort of, oh my gosh, it's just, that's just how the market's worked out and certain shells are less, less common, less produced. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I don't think it's anything more than that to be honest with you. Yeah. That is... That's what I would mythology say. and how it's perceived in the community. But that's okay. Yeah. It makes it fun. Yeah. Yeah. So um awesome. Yeah. Any other questions, definitely like drop those in the uh in the uh, live stream comments or yeah, no, just drop them in the live stream comments. That works best. Um so for for the topics, I know we were talking about uh kind of chatting through a few things. For did you wanna share like your that new pair of split toe derbies that you got? Yeah. I know those are. Yeah. So my very first pair, I have a few pairs that I got in here, some very high end pairs, but this is a pair from uh, Santari Tokyo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Originally uh, made as an MTO for Shoes of Stefan, which is based out of Europe, I believe either Norway or Sweden. This is a split toe derby, which, you know, most of you are familiar with has a pie crust apron, which is hand sewn and a reverse skin stitch uh, on the toe here. But what's unique about it is that it has no back heel counter 
or seam in the back heel. It's all essentially uh, one piece of leather minus the apron and the tongue here that are the only other piece of leather that are uh, there to form the entire upper. So really, really high quality to be able to create this design, to be able to last it so well that you don't see any blemishes, to be able to pattern this hatch grain leather so that it is, and then just the detail that goes into Japanese shoemaking, um, which is, this is my first experience. Like for example, yes, it's a block heel, but if you look over here, there's a um, taper that essentially transitions the heel block to the waist and it's by beveled waist that is just really unique, blinded waist. So every detail seems to be well thought out, well constructed, well assembled. The pattern is a rather unique pattern being that it's uh, harder to manufacture. I haven't seen too many people make uh, seamless heel split toe derby minus I think Winston and a couple others. I think maybe Antonio Micariello could do it, but, uh, but it's definitely something that shows the skill of the craftsman, be it uh, Atsuki Tate, who is the founder of Centauri Tokyo, but it's just a beautiful makeup, not necessarily a makeup for every person who's just getting into shoemaking. This is going to be a shoe that comes at a price premium because of the craftsmanship and the skill, but it's a super cool shoe and I got it used. So I was happy to get a, a reasonable price on it. Still very expensive, but uh, not nearly what have I, I would have pays, paid used. And I would say that their pricing, even though it's high, is at the lower end of the Japanese made to measure, made to order shoemaking community. So, which, you know, they charge as much as seven or $8,000 for, for pairs that are in the bespoke range now. And this pair I think new is around 2000. I got it for about half that, still a lot of money. But when you're talking about the effort and craftsmanship and just the execution of how this shoe is made, it is very impressive. And I had never owned a pair of a Japanese made to measure or made to order shoes in my life. So I kind of thought that their skill was mythologized. Uh, but when I took a look at this shoe, I was honestly like, holy crap, this is really something else. Like you could see how the light plays off that heel block there, the consistency of the thickness of the leather so the heel stack, just the work that's done to transition this block heel into this waist the cleanliness of that waist that's by beveled both on the bottom and the top. Uh, so beveled waist, um, you see this city rubber sole, which has a gentle rounded uh, bottom to it here. Everything is done with just this crazy fit and finish. This might be harder to see, but even the fudge work is done with this like little edge before you get to the fudging, um, which is a clean flat edge and then a very high stitch density leading to this beautiful taper when you get to the blinded waist here. So all of these things just kind of like kind of floored me as a shoe geek getting into shoes and thinking that I'd already reached the pinnacle with makers like Acme and then seeing a pair like this and, and kind of being flabbergasted. So uh, very excited. And I got to give a shout out to, to David uh, because you were the person who pointed me out this pair on eBay and I was able to communicate with the buyer and work out a deal. So thank you. Just those of you looking for Japanese shoemaking, Shoes of Stefan or Santari Tokyo or both are definitely worth your consideration. I think you yourself have had experience with, uh, um, with what, Cornu Blue. And then I think uh, uh, Joe Works who uh, do similar levels of craftsmanship, but more in that good you're welted kind of manufacturing style. So I was, I was kind of flabbergasted by what I saw from, uh, from my first pair from Japan. I got a pair from Seiji McCarthy coming that will hopefully rival this in terms of its uh, work and level of fit and finish. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the Joe works is it's very similar in the sense of like the cleanliness and like how refined all the details are obviously like the, the details are, are a bit different from uh, like a, it's not a factory made shoe, but it's a machine made shoe, um, versus a, uh, you know, a completely handmade shoe. So like, yeah, 
sorry. Um, there was, uh, yeah, um, was, uh, can, can someone, uh, in the chat confirm is there, is the echo fixed? I think there was a echo. Is the audio good? We'll keep going until we hear otherwise. The, uh, <laughs> Ali asked about the, uh, Name of the manufacturer. It is yeah. Santari. Up again for you. Santari, S A N T A R I, Tokyo. That's the name on um, Instagram. I think in Japan they go by the name Tate Shoes, like T A T E. The manufacturer, the lead person for Santari, the lead shoemaker, is a guy named Atsuki, uh, Atsushi, like A T S U S H I, Tate. Um, and they, um, they operate out of a region in Tokyo that's known for its shoemaking. So, um, so a very, very high quality maker that I don't honestly think gets enough recognition. I mean, if, if I knew of this brand, uh, thanks to Shoes of Stefan for finding or at least becoming, making this a little bit more available to Western audiences like in the US, such as me or in Europe. But uh, yeah, if you're willing to pay if you're in this game like we are in terms of how uh you know we're really into the details and the quality and that shoes i think of shoes as a piece of art and so if you're getting something that's really high quality art versus something that's more like lower quality this is this is like this is like a renaissance painting in terms of art so santari tokyo yeah and i'll come uh back in the stream here okay cool so i don't know if you caught the uh uh poll here i was trying to uh multitask here and uh, it looks like uh so i asked like what everyone's favorite color of shell quarterman was and uh, it was uh evenly split between natural color four and color eight no votes for whiskey okay. maybe that's because whiskey doesn't uh doesn't uh exist anymore but um yeah, I well, get confused uh, about what exists between like whiskey and brand, you know, Kanye. There's just so many, so many, you know. And I and I talking <laughs> to or listening to the podcast from uh, the the guys from Horween. Uh, it sounds like they kind of rename some of their shell when they use different dyes and they can't get the same quite the same color consistency. So uh, I know that, for example, what's being called garnet shell now used to be called ruby shell, used to be called color two. But they're not calling a color two anymore. But if you didn't know the difference, they're all about the same color, but they have three different names for color two. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's just it's just it, to me it makes it more confusing. Um, I'm a big fan of color four. I don't have any color six, but I, I know that you do, and I think that is a beautiful color too. I love red browns, and uh, I find that. Color eight is great, but it's a little too dark. But if you could lighten it up a little bit, uh, whatever that color is, be it properly faded color eight or in the case that you have color six, that's that's I would call that my favorite. And I don't even own it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I see a question in here from Sean that we'll get to in a second. But um, the uh, I think like color six is is definitely like my my favorite the one that. Uh, just to harken back to the question about like rare shell cordovan, um, is like is Ravello. So, uh, um, Ravello is like one of those uniquely, I guess, actual like rare colors in the sense that I believe only Alden can have like actual Ravello. There's the like isn't it Ivy Wood is close or at least it's comparable called, to it? Like, Middleborough. Middleborough, sorry. Yeah, I so I think confused. I think that's what like Horween calls it Middleborough, and I think like Got it. a few makers have had it, but it's not something that like is supposed to be sold. But maybe that's probably well, not maybe that's definitely a better question for for like Nick or uh, yeah. Nick Horween or Phil uh, from Ashland Leather. So um, this yeah. is definitely like a color that. Um, like this is my favorite like lighter color it's still it was kind yeah, of Ravello is a beautiful color it's got like little undertones of like olive or something in there a little bit of something a little different in there that i really like um as well that's probably my second 
uh, along with color four shell. Um, those two colors are really rich. Like one thing I love about Alden, um, sorry, not Alden, but Horween shells are that they have this depth of color, which sometimes is challenging because when you have a shoe assembled with different panels, depending on how each of those panels catch light, you may see like what looks like different colors, like plated together. But the truth of the matter is, is that, um, uh, they're all one color, but there's like this depth and kind of the way I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, David, but um, there's times where like, you know, when you use your ebony stick or one of these things, like, and you're able to get rid of some of the scratches on shell, like there's a there's something about the shell to me, it's almost like it has a hidden nap, like a hidden structure that like, if you kind of play around with a nap, it's the same thing that allows you to race defects on the shell. It's the same thing that allows the depth of the color to kind of be variable because of there's like a little depth to the grain structure or something that's hiding underneath how the shell is tanned. I, it's just sort of something I've been thinking about. It's so like, why is shell shell in that unique way? Yeah, so like that is, uh, I don't, oh, here it is. That is, uh, it's pretty accurate. So like the, uh, yeah. like you can't really like see fibers on shell, but, um, like the glazing process is like that glazing roller that just like keeps slapping it like this and it, it does it in yep. the same direction. So it is yep. like it's creating that glaze or that final like polish by just very densely like pushing everything like one way. And then that's also why you kind of get that like color shift when you like look at it flat versus like, like this. Like versus you got to like brush this. it one way or the other or something. Yeah. 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 So like it's. Uh, you know, you know, you can't like manipulate it as much as you can suede, but, um, it definitely like exists. That's, yeah. that's not a, I, my very first stitch down pair was, uh, uh, unglazed natural shell cordovan from, uh, the Chloe tannery and that, uh, hi Jaren, um, that, that definitely had a nap to it before I wore it a bunch. And after I conditioned it, the, that that little fibrous structure now is the best way I can almost like nubuck or something like that slowly went away as the shoe kind of aged and became more and more like what I would expect shell to look like. And it really made me think a lot about, okay, that must be where the depth and the color, you know, the depth and the fixability of the shell kind of comes from, because it's not just a set piece. You're, you're kind of like using, uh, ebony stick like you might a suede brush to kind of erase or suede eraser to erase some of the defects which is kind of cool uh, that's why i like shells it's, it's, it's a, a unique, unique leather, leather for all these unique properties and it's fun fun to have a pair or two in your closet or more depending on who you are yeah let me uh yeah so i echo all of that and speaking of echo is there a uh it sounds like is the, is the echo still going on or uh somebody wants to let us know like when that's when that's happening uh but uh while we're waiting for our technical support um the question from uh from sean which i think you are probably like uniquely positioned to answer yeah. here yeah this is um is this the mod 163 boot i'm not sure which boot that is but uh oh the ashway <laughs> there it is so uh maybe i am uniquely positioned because this is the ashway i have it right here um this is a boot that was named after me because i drew up the design for this boot which is pretty cool and the question that i think sean had was you know sizing of this boot and uh so just so you know, I initially had a pair that I was beta testing for, uh, for crew non Perel, um, that was not this boot that was said to be a proper fitting for my Brannock 10 D and it was their size 43, I believe. And, uh, that boot was definitely a half to a full size large for me. It felt very, very spacious in the toe box. And so for this model, which I'm a true Brannock 10 D maybe a borderline e i have a slightly wider foot but i'm comfortable in almost all d's i size down to a size 42 in this model and this pair fits me fantastically whereas for every other pair i've ever tried um generally a 43 is going to be what fits me the best or even a 43.5 now i will say that a number of the indonesian makers their 
their sizing is fairly generous. I've, I've noticed this. I know that this has been an issue with Underhood and others as sort of people struggling with sizing. If anything, the sizing tends to be generous for a lot of the makers lasts. But from my standpoint, if you're going to go with this specific Ashway boot, I would think about either saying, hey, I want to do sizing the way that Ashwin did sizing, which was essentially to scale down the size. And these shoes have really nice arch support into them. And I still feel like with that size down, the arch did end up in the right place. All the foot, you know, the widest part of my foot ended up in the right spot. So I think that I would size down to a, you know, a half to a full size below what you think. So normally I'd be a 43 as a Brannock 10 D. In this case, I was a 42 and very happy with that choice. Hope that answers your question. Um, I'll say for those of you who are interested, this, the quality and craftsmanship of this boot is at the level of some of the best makers. I mean, you could just see the consistency of the stitching and the details. Uh, they do a really good job skiving their leathers down to create a nice pattern. So wanted to give Kenwin and his team in Indonesia a shout out because I think that they're producing really high quality boots. Um, pricing is probably on par, if not maybe slightly higher than some of the other makers coming out of Indonesia, but you're getting a very, very high quality boot. Got it. Hopefully that... Uh... Hopefully that helps for, uh, sorry, I lost, uh, Sean, Sean, hopefully that, that helps definitely let us know. Um, all right. Is, is, does it echo right now? Echo. Is it echoing? What I'm going to turn down my audio too, just so that in case, and I'm going to put my mic a little closer to me in case it's me because my mic was a little further away. Maybe that's better. And it's, is it echoing right now? And I assume like when we say like, like Ashwin's. Okay. Hi Ashwin. guys. Right, Hopefully it's not yeah, okay. Non echoey. Echo? No echo? It's good to see nine of you guys here pretty late on, uh, East Coast time. Appreciate y'all. Want to make it worth your while. Uh, what about now? So while he's figuring out Echo, I'm just going to show you another cool pair. This is a pair from HEA that I really like. Um, I know many people who are getting into shoes are also kind of exploring the boot world. And this is a very elevated pair of hand welted shoes by a bespoke maker who's now having a made to order line that's a little bit more affordable. And this pair was around, I think, five or six hundred bucks for a, a, a Anane English grain leather in this beautiful makeup. It's an Oxford style boot. And it's actually came in at a price a bit cheaper than the Ashway. One of the things, and we, we kind of like touched on it, but I'd. I'd uh... I'd kind of be like curious of a lot of like a lot of the shoemakers that you were just kind of talking about between like Kenwin uh, or Kroon Non Perel, uh, Ichigo Ichie. Everybody knows I love saying Ichigo Ichie as much as I love wearing his shoes, but um, uh, like a lot of the shoemakers like in that realm have, uh, you know, kind of like the big, like a very like strong like uh, value proposition going for them. Whereas like Santari, um, you know, is quite like the spectrum. I thought they don't have. You're going to pay a lot for a Santari. Right. But it, like, that's like one of those, like, you know, shoes that just, you got to like pay what you got to pay in order to get it. And yeah. like, you know, it is, it is what it is. So it's like for mm -hmm. like those premium shoes, like not necessarily are they overpriced, but like, is there like, what's your opinion on a uh um you know uh kind of like a, a losing proposition as you get like more expensive like is is the value uh linear kind of like growth and like the cost and like the increasing quality or does like the cost kind of yeah up while like the increase I, I do think there is a you know from a from a quality perspective, there's a law of diminishing returns. The more you pay, That's you're right. going to get a really, you can spend 
between three and five hundred dollars and get a really nice pair of shoes from say a Goodyear welted maker like uh, Crockett and Jones or Carmina and be entirely satisfied with that pair if you're not as enthusiastic about shoes as some of us I mean I would tell most people who are looking for a good pair of shoes to go look at Carmina or look at uh, Crockett and Jones or somebody like that uh, over a brand like Allen Edmonds because I think that the quality jump is rather high at that point you know you're paying Three to five hundred dollars for a pair of Allen Edmonds, which in my mind are not very good uh, quality shoes. You can spend two hundred more, which is a lot for most people, but you're going to get a shoe that's going to have a lot more pride of ownership. It's going to be much more comfortable. It's going to last longer. It's going to just have cleaner details. And so great, you know, to make that jump right there. Now, once you take the next jump, probably into the six or seven hundred dollar range, I do still think that you're if you're enthusiastic enough about shoes, owning a pair from say like an Antonio Macariello or um, Ichigo Ichie, for example, is gonna give you another step up in terms of fit and finish and craftsmanship. And if you start looking at the details, you're gonna see, oh, wow, this shoe has more, you know, stitch density, or this shoe has more uh, of a unique, comfortable last or something like that. It's got a little more style built into it. Um, so there's certain things that are starting linear with a bit of a curve. But then there's certain things that are not like you can, you know, you can make an argument that a brand such as like Alden in the U.S. charges a lot for the quality that they offer, but they also offer a lot in terms of resaleability, uh, some of the materials that they use and the fact that they're made in the United States where the labor costs are higher. So you kind of get into these discussions where it's not always linear. Um, and, you know, there's others like I know Rose Anvil is the guy who's been talked about a lot, but who's. Kind of deconstructed a pair of Aldens and said, "There, you know, there, there. You should pay two to three hundred dollars for this pair, not six hundred. I think that's actually. After I've thought about it for a while, I think it's kind of bogus, to be honest with you. I think it's a uh, internet. You know, he's 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 uh, he's milking that bad boy for all it's worth. Um, but you know, if you look at almost any pair of Alden Indies, uh, those shoes will last for 20, 30, 40 years, um, and well past when any of us are likely to still own that shoe." And the leatherboard is going to break in a little bit easier. And sure, if you wear it every day on a construction site, which I guarantee you I'm not doing, that shoe might break down. But most of us have no need to wear a construction uh, boot or shoe, and we'd have to pay a consequence of price and comfort to be able to break that thing in. And so he comes from a background that's more um, work workman kind of sort of need. Um, I think most of us come from more of the fashion or style side of things. And you're you're still getting a really high quality pair of shoes that if it's worth six hundred dollars to you to own an american made high quality shoe great you know like go for it but there's other brands out there that may offer a different value proposition for different area different interests and different sort of aesthetics and different needs yeah so first just like touching on the the last part there about like alden and uh I'm drawing a blank on his actual name, but um uh Weston? Yeah, Weston on on that. Like I, I would definitely agree. Um uh, you know, where it started, like really like resonated and was just like kind of like on the facts. It was just like I'm cutting it open and like this is what I see. And then like definitely like since like the Alden, you know, uh Alden Army kind of like exploded and like freaked out. Um <laughs> He, uh, I definitely think he probably that he like milked and is still milking that, uh, kind of like thread, thread line, like all the way, all the way. And good for him, man. Like, good yeah, for him. Nothing, nothing <laughs> it, but it's just kind of like rehashing the same thing over and over. Like, can they like rebuild Aldens and make them better? Like, uh, like Aldens are what they are. They're not the best shoe in the world, but arguably, like, if you're looking for uh, a hybrid, like, dress casual boot with that like six inch uh aesthetic it's uh and and really like primarily in like shell cordovan but yeah. if that's what you're looking for like it's very hard to get a a pair that looks better than that um, yeah i think and, there's certain shoes that are built for a certain identity yeah and alden created that identity along with floorsheim and a couple others that have now since gone away for that americana whatever you want to call it style in France, it's J.M. Weston. In Europe, it's, you know, churches or whatever. But, like, you know, I think that you're paying to some degree for the brand identity 
but you're also paying for the fact that those shoes are made where they're made, you know? So it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, they, they do to a degree have a MTO program. Omar, uh, yeah. said that he wished they did. It's, it's just that it's not like, instead of you just being able to kind of put in a single MTO whenever you want, you essentially have to like campaign and get, uh, um, get like a, a, a retailer to uh, run that for you and fill the group and then you can get it in about like three to five decades but it'll be great <laughs> shoes of stefan actually i think runs mtos with alden uh yeah. but again you have to be on board with whatever gosh. the mto is. it's certainly not as customizable as some of the indonesian chinese and other makers that are sort of creating the ultimate mto making like you can pretty much design a shoe to your exact desires which is cool but also you know comes with its own compromises and sacrifices because there's variability in what they're using for their stuff and you know if you you don't know what the sizing is with alden you know if you know alden sizing and you can pick up a pair of aldens anywhere you, you're pretty much dialed in if you have yeah. uh, berry sizing and a plaza size you pretty much are good with the last from alden across the board somebody can tell you exactly what you need yeah yeah and as long as you want like color eight or color eight uh you can get it just in color eight or black uh, color eight or black or or, yeah. brown or tan as long as you want one of those colors alden <laughs> is your is your shoemaker but no i mean i'm just you know like all of it's just kind of like you can make fun of of uh what it is but like they they do it they they do it they do they don't take on new leathers it's like a miracle for them to agree to work with yeah. the new leather because of like the cost it it they have to incur to like adjust all the machines and train the staff, especially like when it's a grain or a yeah. tumble leather, because then they like have to deal with like, what's the, uh, uh, to what degree can I actually like last it and what patterns work with it without them like distorting yeah. the, the pattern in the tumbled leathers and stuff. So it's, um, I get it. It's just that like, I think they would be, if it's even possible, like more popular than they are now, if they were like a little yeah. more to some, uh, you know, trying new things, I guess. Yeah. And they still, you're still getting a great shoe. You know, like if it's, a, if it's your interest in buying, you know, uh, buying a pair of Alden and that's where your head is. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it, to be honest with you. I, I have two pairs um, of Alden shoes. Uh, I have a leisure hand zone that I just got that I've, put on my channel that I got used and I got a pair of new buck, uh, like tan new buck, um, long wings, which are kind of my, one of my flashier shoes that I just, I like the Alden long wing pattern quite a bit. So I wanted a pair of long wings that I could, uh, have that was a little bit more unique. And so, yeah, and if you guys ever have questions about Alden, I've, I've owned a number of Alden and I can tell you all about them. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen those like tan new buck ones. I actually, oh, have uh, yeah. sort of been long they have, they have a, uh, what you call it? They have a, uh, like a, um, a wedge sole on them, which is my only pair with a wedge sole. Honestly, right. I'm not a big wedge sole person, but it all kind of works as a almost, uh, casual shoe, almost on the sneaker shoe side of things. Um, it's a very light tan new buck. I, I really like new buck leathers uh, as well. I just find them to be aesthetically pleasing and uh, it's just a cool shoe. It's uh, almost like a natural colored um, tan new buck. It's on my, it's on my, I've posted them a few times on my, uh, on my uh, Instagram. Yeah. I have to, I'll have to take a look, but cool. the, uh, so let me, uh, I'm going to circle back to, to Jaren's question here, but yeah, I there's a question. I missed it. I want to uh, just quickly, like, uh, before my like brain explodes, circle back to like the the question that like started this whole like Alden topic, which was like the diminishing returns. Uh, thank yes. you for calling that uh, kind of a, a phrase out there. So uh, for for my from my perspective, like the. Uh, um, it's like when you're like learning a new, you know, learning a new skill, like practicing like a new craft or anything like, uh, or even like going to the gym and like working out like the gains that you see at the very like early part of the world or of the spectrum of like whatever it is happen like really fast and really like exaggerated. Like you like see a lot of like, you know, uh, 
like you you just gain a lot of strength very quickly when you start going to the gym after a very like long extended break or if you start learning a new subject you kind of like pick up a broad spectrum of like surface level information and you feel like you've like grown a lot same thing with like that like 200 to like 800 dollar price point there's like a significant difference but then like when you get to like a thousand fifteen hundred two thousand four thousand like the differences that you can notice to like the uh, kind of like casual observer i think are like kind of flatten out and they all kind yeah. of start to like blend together and look the same but i think the uh there are still you know benefits in their art there's still like value in that like upper echelon it's just that mm -hmm. the nuances are so uh, uh like kind of dialed in to the last design or the pattern design or how any of those steps are actually like executed that you don't see it in the final product and you probably don't like when you wear it you probably don't feel that like oh i recognize that this guy did x y and z but yeah the overall experience is like is usually significantly better and the reason for that is because of all of that either like years of training and years of practice or whatever technique that individual has picked up that is the reason that you know their shoes cost so much more than than others and uh, it's kind of hard to like articulate or be able to compare and show it but you know it's yeah i don't think it's it, it is hard. one of the challenges why we we get caught in the like i think people do try to do that um yeah. by kind of showing off all the details but it's not necessarily just about the details like there's right. there's a lot more that goes into like how you're actually conceiving constructing and 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 visualizing a shoe that comes with experience that you don't really get until you try a pair on. And if you, if you're in that two to seven hundred dollar range, you're probably already like, and you're comfortable there, just stay there. And if you're like really kind of enthusiastic about exploring the space more and want to spend more money, then then sure. But you are gonna at a certain level have to get to a point where you can, you can appreciate those things, but not everybody's gonna appreciate them. Right. The yes. Perfectly said. So, uh, to, uh, what question did I miss? It was Jaren's question, right? Uh, let's see here. Um, do you, oh, where all your dress goods? Okay. Got it. In the winter, uh, or do you only wear them in nice weather? I wear my Indies and a pair of Grant Stones in snow. Others I baby. I wear all of mine all the time. I, uh, wear like my, uh, clinch engineer boots to like shovel the other day and i wore a pair of like enzo bonafis bonafe i always like butcher that but wore those the other day and uh, in the snow the same thing i wear like my shell in the snow like it's you know like the snow and rain isn't it's something that you have to be like aware of like you don't just like constantly saturate them but salt is like the really uh that's the killer um yeah so as long as you're not like splashing around in like you know puddles of salt leather is uh leather is pretty resilient when it comes to uh precipitation yeah yeah i, I just had a visual of somebody splashing around in salt water <laughs> with their <laughs> shoe. I, I live in the northwest uh kind of in the seattle area and so it rains a lot here throughout the year it doesn't snow all that much it does snow and if it does snow I, i've actually participated in the past three stitch down patina thunderdome shoes where you're like intentionally trying to kind of age your shoes like probably is the way that that contest seems to veer towards is kind of beating up beating up your shoes is not quite fair but i feel like the people who've won that contest tend to have pretty beat up looking shoes i am not one to beat up my shoes so i tend to wear them more in variable climates when i want to achieve the the look of an aging shoe which maybe that leather is a more natural leather and i want to darken it or break it in in a certain way so i'm going to wear it more i have a rotation of about 50 shoes and so it's a lot of shoes and probably more than most people uh, honestly so i have the opportunity to pick and choose what shoes but honestly i wear almost all my shoes any shoe that has a rubber sole on it uh, i'm game for wearing it pretty much any time of the year there are certain shoes that I consider a little bit more elevated. Some of my shell cordovan boots, for example, or some of my more dress shoes with leather soles that I'm not going to wear out in 
uh, in the rain or in the bad weather, just because I don't want to get the leather. I don't want to have to like work super hard to get the leather to look good again. And so I might wear that from the garage to my parking lot, which is indoors at work, in, indoors and work wear, wear it during the winter, but I'm, it's never seeing actual weather. Um, but there's other pairs that I think more of my heritage style footwear, uh, which I am wearing pretty much throughout the year with denim and stuff and not thinking about it too hard. Yeah. And uh, so they like, this is my, this is a pair and I, I, I pretty much echo all that, except like I just kind of like gave up on that and I just like wear them whenever now I was going to wear these yeah. to double the other day, but then I was like, that's yeah, the rodeo cool. boots. Um, but yeah, I mean like the, uh, so like these would be like perfectly fine to wear to shovel or wear like basically there's no reason that like these would be any more delicate than anything else. They just like, you know, look it and like the price associated with them makes you like feel that way. But leather is like pretty resilient. And again, like to act, I guess to like, one of the, I guess the the cautionary tale that like Ashwin calls out is like a very good one where um, leather will definitely respond and like bounce back. So like nothing that really happens outside of like salt stains, you know, salt stains are are kind of problematic and could be less than reversible, uh, if that's a way to say it. Basically, like it's yeah, I think I think the salt kind of has a chemical interaction with some of the oils, maybe leaching the oils or yeah disturbing you you know so you you know you, you don't want to go too crazy if it's a super salty cold day you right know, wear the pair of shoes that you don't mind messing up you'll end up being salty after that if that happens <laughs> i would never wear my acme chuckas i was gonna ask you about this yeah tell me uh, but yeah what i was gonna say is like if you you know if i so i wore these in like uh we didn't get a foot of snow but maybe like six seven inches and yeah uh, this is like Zug leather. So it's like extremely yeah, like pretty rugged leather and, and rugged and all that kind of stuff. But like literally it just like the snow was like above the boot. Uh, <laughs> and like um, literally like, you know, 24 hours later, it just dried and it was just completely yeah. normal. Some other leather yeah. like longer than that. You may have to like condition them. You may have to just kind of like wear it out and it may take six months for it to kind of return to what you would expect normal to be yeah. um i think and, there's also like it's yeah. a, that's a great point you make not all leathers are equal in your boots like there's some leathers that like to be treated a little bit more harsh is not the right word but kind of worn because they'll develop like i know like merriam tannery leathers their horse butt leathers age really really well if you don't baby them but also don't destroy them like if you're kind of straddling the line between like okay i'm gonna wear these in all conditions this is gonna be my like daily driver boot shoe whatever for a while those leathers are really meant to be worn and they actually evolve in really cool ways. And again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for beating up your shoes, but if you care for them and care for them gently and not over care for them, just kind of find that line between that conditioning them every now and again, brushing them off after you get them at home, using shoe trees, uh, the things that I think you would do if you care about any pair of footwear that you have, like do that with your shoes, but just wear them. They're going to develop a little bit more versus a pair like my Acme where I, I kind of honestly like, while people like to see their shoes age, this is a pair that like to me is like a little work of art. And I, I'm gonna wear it gently. I'm gonna wear it at work, indoors primarily only. It's got this beautiful leather sole. I'm not gonna wanna trash this pair. Like I'll do my best to wear it. You know, there'll be some creasing and stuff that comes from just wearing it, but like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be sitting there trying to uh, stitch down, you know, sort of patina thunderdome it because that's not the intent. Uh, of that pair versus like, say this, uh, crew non Perel, um, Miriam Tannery Ashway boot that I, uh, showed earlier. This is a pair that I will wear in pretty much any condition. This Miriam leather, you can see it's a horse butt leather. It doesn't really crease. It just has these kind of micro creases and rolls. And just with a little brushing, the natural oils, I've never conditioned this boot and it just still has this lovely shine to it. Every time I wear it, I just kind of, the, the, the oils kind of emerge a little bit and I just do a little brush and bada bing, bada boom, it's uh, just ready to go. And so this is a pair that I do want to wear more consistently outdoors. I try to find reasons to wear it and not baby it because I think it's going to age really well, even as I take care of it. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, 
and I mean, like, so just, uh, I feel like thoughts and then, uh, I gotta wrap up, but like, you know, the yeah. chuck a boot, like that could definitely do everything that like the other one could like, there's nothing that it, it's not delicate by any means. It's just that like, you don't necessarily want that, you know, yeah. aesthetic results of like what it would mean to go swimming in them. For sure. Like, uh, I know there's somebody in the current stitch down Patina Thunderdome who has a very similar model to this, uh, this pair from Ichigo Ichie, um, in a bison leather that they're, they're wearing like, like a stitch down pair. They're kind of beating the crap out of it and like wearing it across any condition. This is a pair that I'm going to take care of. I, I just find that the character of this leather and the beauty that I am able to like get from the getup, this is going to be a work pair that I wear with a pair of nice dress chinos or slacks or, you know, it's going to, it's going to, for me, uh, going to be more important that I preserve the look and vibe and feel of this shoe versus, and I want it to look more like how it started looking, I guess. And that maybe that's what it is. There's certain pairs that I have that I really want to look, keep it looking nice and pristine. And yes, I want to wear them. I don't want them to kind of completely look unworn, but like to wear them very gently and very, um, you know, without much, you know, without trying to age them intentionally. And there's other pairs where I'm going to like, yeah, like a pair of boots that I'm going to go at it, break them in a little. And there for me is joy on both sides. It's why I'm into heritage footwear and why I'm into classic dress shoes, where I find that both uh, approaches to shoe wear, uh, as long as you're still caring for your shoes and I care for my shoes regularly, um, is still part of the process. It doesn't mean that you're not just trying to neglect your shoes and bang the crap out of them for six months and see how, how old they look by the end of it. It's for me, it's a, a little bit of like, yeah, proper shoe care still can give you a really unique way of your shoe evolving over time. A lot of the Japanese uh, shoe enthusiasts have a really unique take on shoe aging. Like I think it's why clinch boots, like your, your boot you have uh, David, you know, the way that the, those shoe boots are clicked, they form these really cool rolls. And I know there's people who kind of create these really high shine elements to their roles. And it's just like kind of mind blowing what people are doing with how their shoes and it's meant to age. Like, yeah, yeah, there it is, the rolls. And you're doing it right there. That just, it looks like almost like, uh, uh, it's like, I don't know, it's just like roll, like curving and sinistry. I don't know what the right word is, but it's cool. Desert. It looks like a <laughs> sand dune, like in a yeah. desert where it's just kind of like no rhyme or reason. Yeah, but, it's like sand yeah. dunes or something. Beautiful. <laughs> I mean, like this, uh, I mean, I guess like what, what I was maybe like getting at before was like, uh, because I was like holding up that, that boot from Antonio is, uh, where is it? Yeah. That's a pair that you've worn fairly often, but it looks beautiful still. Like looks almost brand new. Yeah. And I mean, like, the, I think the lesson is like, whenever you like examine anything re very close up, like you notice, you know, like there's polish falling off of the toe and the heel yeah. is all like gashed up but uh that's just because like i haven't taken the time to clean them off and then repolish them but like if you were to stand like just like this far away from me like you wouldn't notice yeah. that and they would just look like as pristine as they look great they, they look new to me you know and, and, and like the not like vintage leathers but like the older leathers so like i think this is like vintage kudu and uh at least like nine 1990s box calf on the toe oh yeah the peabody stuff right yeah and like the older leathers are just have a bit more rigidity to them rigidity stability i don't know like they're they're just a yeah. little more like substantial the animals uh they made know, a man they made those animals better in the 1980s basically those are healthier animals is that right yeah, i have no idea <laughs> the farm, like the farming culture and like a whole bunch yeah. of things like have just has just changed uh yeah. and like the calfskin that you can get today not it's that not it, the quality yeah, of what you can but get it's not the same thickness and grain character that it would have been 30 years ago 40 years ago and like as you go back like it's just constantly changed jesper had a post recently about that right like you kind of have to accept more blemishes or something like that in new footwear so i'm just kidding i don't yeah. know yeah, I know uh, what you're talking about, though. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. 
this when, is another pair I just figured I'd throw up there for for the people watching. Um, you don't have any of this pair, but this is a pair from Winston Shoemaker. Um, I um, have become friendly with uh, Emil Putra from Winston. He's a, a ma maker that was, at least I kind of became more interested from Thunder March, who's a Winston. Winston is a, um, a, a shoe enthusiast who goes by the name Thunder March, who has these really cool, unique uh, makeups from all these makers throughout kind of East Asia. And uh, and this is uh, Winston, who is Indonesian, uh, comes from Bandung, Indonesia, and has a boot line that's called Midas Bootmaker, but he started as Winston Shoemaker and just some of the highest quality footwear I've ever seen. So he kind of blends the aesthetic of dress wear and with a more rugged kind of fit and finish in some ways. Like, so you get this pretty aggressive fiddle back waist, but then you got your um, Vibram Explosion, um, you know, sole guards and, uh, and heel back lift. And then, yeah, you could see this very unique toe plate that I've never seen anything quite like that before. Uh, pretty cool uh, toe plate. And this is also a seamless heel model. So he is able to design and innovate and create like a very unique piped austerior bro austerity brogue. This was a design that I kind of drew up based on a model that he had designed with Winston uh, Thunder March. But I wanted, he had a cap toe Oxford and I wanted an austerity brogue with a seamless heel and he was able to take that idea use one of his stock lasts and create in my mind a shoe that i will want to look like this for a long time this is a steel uh museum grained leather from ilsia tannery it's like a hatch grain but uh not your typical horween hatch grain you can see how the light plays off of it it's got this really cool unique aesthetic to it and again, if you didn't know much about this shoe, you would say, well, gosh, yeah, it looks like a nice austerity brogue, but it's got this piping detail. The shoe is two pieces of leather to form the entire upper. It's got all the, you know, bespoke kind of level detailing with the offset heel block, the uh, blinded waist with a, um, you know, nice bevel to it, fiddle back and uh, all these details that kind of go in. But for me, all of those details really come together in a very unique way. And this is a shoe that I want to enjoy for a while. Like that's another thing somebody has asked me is like, do you wear your shoes right away? Or do you, do you kind of put them on a shelf for a while? I actually put my shoes on a shelf for a while. If they're like that shoe, if they're really high level, like I can look at them and enjoy them aesthetically for a while before I even start to wear them. Um, I'm going to do that for a while, but that's just my, my thing. Cause I have enough of a collection of shoes to look at. I don't know how you are with your shoes. If you're like a direct wear, uh, but it's something I was curious about your thoughts. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Same day. You don't wait. Yeah, I do. I mean, I'll try them on just to make sure they fit, but that's about it for a while. <laughs> I'm a delayed kind of gratification. I, it's not even delayed. I don't know what it is because I have the shoes, but I, you know, I just kind of like looking at them for a while. It's weird, but I'm weird and I'm cool with that. And I know you all are weird too. And uh, yeah, those are pretty cool. Dapper, uh, love, love, love that ebony stick uh, that you guys came up with. I know David, that was your idea. And uh, the Dapper guys, oh my God, that thing is the best. Somebody actually was like, dude, you're posting on that a lot. I'm like, yeah, because that freaking tool is amazing, man. Like if any of you are not aware of the ebony stick who are on this thread and if any of you have any thicker leather, doesn't you have to be shell cordovan, like horse butt leathers, other things. It is a magnificent tool for kind of working out some of the scratches, dings, dents, and unsightly uh, rolls on your shoes to properly take care of them. There's the website he's putting up. There it is right there. That little thing right there is a miracle uh, for shoe care. A hundred bucks, it's worth a lot more than that. So, um, from my standpoint, and it, I, I don't think those guys can keep it in stock. So, um, so get on your, the notify me when it's in stock thing and get yourself one. Cause I, I paid for mine. Or actually, I mean, I sort of paid for, I got a discount, but, uh, but at the end of the day, it was, uh, I got the good pleasure of trying it out right after you'd released it. Cause you and I are buddies and, um, and I don't give a crap about like advertising for anybody or anything. I don't, I pay for pretty much everything I show and, um, and 
yeah, it's definitely worth it. So go get yourself an ebony stick. Yeah, and and uh, I was to to be fair, like you did, like it was uh, like a prototype, and like you didn't have like all the packaging and stuff that that came with it. So like, uh, you know, you got a discount, but like there was a few like a few things kind of uh, still in the works at the time. So like, uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it was uh, definitely something that we needed to share and get some get some feedback just to make sure we were uh, we weren't just kind of in our own echo chamber making ourselves for feel. sure. Yeah, right. no, it's it's legitimately a cool tool. Like I've been able to really work through some difficult things on some of my older shell cordovan pairs, and uh, you know I've been very impressed. Yeah, yeah, and there are a few videos. Uh, well, a few. There's. Uh, endless amount of videos about ebony sticks on the channel but uh a few yeah. more recent ones about this one if you want to check those out but uh yeah we'll have to uh make our way through this like last uh batch of them which was like 50 which is uh kind of crazy that like sold nice. out in four days but um we'll have to well we're the goal is not to constantly have uh batches that are sold out but to just have them in stock available yeah whenever yeah. folks want uh want to need them so um yeah yeah I'm something gonna... so basic so hard to get it's pretty cool yeah uh i was gonna say i do gotta gotta run it's getting getting late i got uh I'm actually traveling this week for work so Ooh, look at you uh, i got done with a lot of my travel i'm in the medical field and sports medicine so i travel with teams and uh so i'm wearing my boots pretty much all over and shoes on the sidelines in every situation. So I don't really baby them, but I, I think shoes are meant to be worn, but they're also meant to be appreciated yeah. as work smart. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think like, that's the kind of beauty of it. You can kind of pick and choose how you want to, how you want to do it or how you want to uh, wear them, age them or uh, admire them. Right. Yeah, I mean, we should have a hashtag, shoes as works of art. You could shorten that to sh SH for the shoes and the ART for the art. Hashtag shart. I think that'd be really cool. I knew that's where you were going with that. I mean, what else could you get that mixed up with? Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't, sure. I'm, I'm not maybe up on the lingo of like, we can you know, do I'm not gazing. You know, we talked about like bussing and freaking Johns and all that crap. <laughs> pardon me. Um, pardon me for any of you. I might be offending, but <laughs> but uh, but I don't have any Johns. I just have jeans and um, hashtag shark. All right. I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate <laughs> stuck around for this, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll definitely have to do it again sooner than than last time um any other questions uh or any interest in the ebony stick reach out to uh justin from dapper woodworks you can uh use the link in the uh in the live chat and uh we'll see you guys next time thanks guys see you guys